Panel 4. Depictions of Blindness in Comics. Image, a black and white drawing of superhero character Daredevil with a target as the background. Text, Depictions of Blindness in Comics. Panel Moderator. Anil Lewis. Panelists. Joe Stretch A. Jose Alanas. M. Sabine Rear. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. If you've been with us for the full day, thank you so much for enjoying a full day on this topic. Uh, I know I am, and I hope I hope it has been the same for you. If you're just now joining us, a few access notes. Um, you can, uh, if you want to be able to personalize the captions a bit, you can also access them at tinyurl.com slash longmore captions. We have chat turned off, uh, except for a few key, um, key information you need, but please use the Q and A as if it's a chat room. Uh, many people have been asking throughout the day if that will be shared afterwards. It will be shared with everyone uh, so you can go back in, get those resources, spend more time in there if you want. Um, let's see. We also have a, a Facebook group set up, and that should be a space where after today you can continue to make uh, conversations and collaboration happen. Um, that can be found at facebook.com slash groups slash, slash comics. A11Y. And we also have a Twitter hashtag for day, today, and that's hashtag comics A11Y. Um, with that, we are now turning to a really important topic. We spent the day talking about the different ways that we can think about making comics accessible. But now we have to ask, why would we want to access comics if the depictions of blindness in them are offensive and outdated? And so we're going to explore what it looks like to make them better um, from, from lots of folks who've been thinking about this for some time. So I'm very grateful to our panelists. With that, I'd like to ask Anil to turn on his video and we will pass it to you. Thank you, Anil. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, full disclosure. <laughs> I'm the executive director of blindness initiatives for the National Federation of the Blind. That's not the disclosure. The disclosure is uh, I'm not a comics aficionado. So uh, I accepted this responsibility because of the respect that I have for Ting uh, for a long relationship. But I think that she had an ulterior motive in inviting me to moderate this panel because uh, it has sparked an interest that did not previously exist. And I've been able to sit in some of the presentations throughout the day. And I think that there's a lot of potential um, in, in leveraging this to promote some more programs uh, throughout the organization. Uh, so it's really been interesting and a very good learning process for me. I briefly had an opportunity to talk uh, with our panelists and I think that you, like I, will find their perspectives very enlightening, um, hopefully uh, very encouraging with respect to what we can do through this particular medium. Uh, before I go to the introduction, I need to say uh, my name is Anil Lewis. I'm the executive director of Blindness Initiatives for the National Federation of the Blind. I'm a black male in my late 50s. I have a shaved head, um, salt and pepper mustache with a goatee. Uh, and I wore my orange uh, polo shirt today because that was the most vibrant color that I have in my conservative wardrobe when I was thinking about trying to be vibrant. Uh, for this discussion of comics and graphic novels. Um, so it is indeed my pleasure to introduce or allow this distinguished panel to introduce themselves. Um, and what I'll do is I'll start by allowing them to tell you who they are, um, their credentials. But I also want to steer this in the beginning with a question. So as we go and introduce, as you go and introduce yourselves, I, I want you to answer the question of what? Why? Why do we even bother uh, trying to worry about making this very visual medium accessible to blind individuals? And I think that that will bring us into a space where we can start talking about the depiction of blindness within that medium. So we're going to start with, uh, let's start with, now I have Sabin, it's Jaws, it's pronounced your name, but is it Sabine? Yes, it's Sabine. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank oh, you. Not at all. Um, I can I can definitely get us started. Um, thanks very much, Anil, and um, I'm really excited to get to participate on this panel um, and speak with all of you. My name is Sabine Rear. 
Um, I am a blind cartoonist. Um, I'll give a quick description of myself. I'm a white woman in my late 20s with um, brown hair cut into a sort of a grown out quarantine mullet. Um, I'm sitting in my living room, which is white walls, and uh, there's a big window behind me. Um, I'm not sure what color my shirt is, and I'm wearing glasses that have kind of a pink tint to them. Um, a little bit about me and my work, as I said, I'm a cartoonist, so I make um, primarily autobiographical short comics and zines um, about um, my experience with blindness, public space, um, gender, and sort of navigating uh, multiple identities in shared public spaces, art spaces, things like that. Um, I also make comics about pro wrestling and whatever I want. Um, and I, I like to talk a lot about um, being a blind person making comics and um, blindness sort of being a part of my art process and practice, as well as um, sort of the way I approach the media that I take in. Um, so in that way, I'm really excited to talk about this with our um, wonderful panel. I'm also, um, I'm an educator. I teach the uh, comics portfolio program here in Portland at the Independent Publishing Resource Center. Um, I'm an organizer with the Portland Zine Symposium, and I'm a pillar of the local karaoke community during times when karaoke exists. Mm -hmm. um, thanks very much for having me. Sure. So what, why do we bother? Uh, why do we bother? That. That's right. There was a question. <laughs> why do we bother? So for me, what the, the question is answered by sort of my interest in making this work, right? Why do I bother making a visual medium as someone with low vision? Um, and then why do I make it about myself, right? Um, so I think those things are tied together for me. Um, I, I will say that I don't see myself reflected in a lot of visual media and particularly in comics. Um, we're gonna talk about that, I think, as we move through the questions that you've prepared for us. And um, I, I find it really empowering to, uh, to bother um, to bring myself into that visual space um, and to engage with um, the aspects of visual media that I find um, interesting. And then in terms of characterization, I think um, we not only want to see ourselves in media, but we don't want to see ourselves misrepresented. So we want to be talking about who's in the room making what choices about whose story gets told. Um, and I think that's, that's a really important part of what we're going to talk about today. Very nice. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, the next gentleman I'm introducing, uh, I, have, I consider him a friend of, of many, many years uh, who has uh, moved kind of away from uh, the focus in blindness, uh, but really into a different way where he brings his expertise and the experience uh, to create opportunities for blind people that otherwise wouldn't exist. So, uh, Joe Streche, why don't you yes. tell our attendees a little bit about who you are and tell them why you think we bother. Awesome. Thank you, Anil. Uh, it's it's so uh, so great to be on here, and I, I think of you as a friend and and someone I look up to in general. Truthfully, um, yeah, I, I I'm a co-executive producer for Apple TV Plus's C, uh, and I've been a producer on this show for three seasons. I've also uh, worked on other streaming television shows, including Marvel's Daredevil uh, on Netflix, the OA on Netflix. Uh, worked in uh, uh, production uh, like uh, in books. Uh, so for Scholastic, there's a book, uh, a series called Dragon Masters, where I worked on uh, a book called uh, The Call of the Sound Dragon, uh, where I helped with uh, the some help the writer with uh, the story uh, and around the blindness aspects, but also I helped with the illustrations. So uh, uh, describing what uh, the illustrations and even modeling some things uh, for the illustrations in the book. Um, so, and I've worked in theater and other productions, but a lot of my work is spent around uh, creating accessibility and inclusion uh, in the film world, but I also get to block every scene in uh, the TV show, the streaming television show I work in. So, and on a visual medium, and I have no sight anymore. I, I, my vision, I lost over a number of years and I'm totally blind now. Uh, I've gone through a period where I had low vision back in the day and, and grew up reading comics and, uh, Comics were important to me and, and uh, characters. And when I, when I first learned that I was losing my vision and I was, I was seeking Asian in media and what I was looking for. And, and I wanted cool people that are cool and doing things and active and out there in the world. And, uh, you know, I, I love the hike and be out there in the world and uh, 
do all kinds of things. And I, I didn't see that in the media. And I, I, my, my undergraduate work is around uh, communications and media where we studied like the impact of media. Uh, and then my graduate work is around blindness, around orientation mobility. So how to travel with white cane and uh, the guide dog, and, uh, but also teaching children and adults, uh, daily living skills and life skills. Um, and I kind of feel like I have become full circle, but I get to impact the media that's out there. And I, I, I echo what it, what's been mentioned before. And I think we're getting closer and closer to uh, getting the voices of, of persons with disabilities able to actually have their voices out there. You know, I, I didn't create my show uh, that I work on, but I, I get to block every scene in our show. Um, you know, I don't make every decision, but I, I try my best to make sure my voice is heard. And then also to make sure that we're bringing on uh, numerous people who are blind or low vision and, and then uh, them also getting to impact the story and, and, and what lives on the screen and uh, lives in the story every day, so. Nice, I, I think you kind of woven an answer through that narrative, so I appreciate that. Um, this next gentleman, who we, when we were prepping for this particular panel, uh, just impressed me with his whole historical perspective of the portrayal of people with disabilities in comics um, and graphic novels. So Jose, if you could introduce yourself to our attendees and then tell us why you think we bother trying to make such a visual medium accessible. If you're speaking, Jose, you're still muted. <laughs> there you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, you know, you, you, uh, you don't teach on Zoom for a couple of months and you just forget everything. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, you uh, don't use it, you lose it. Yeah, that's just the reality of life. Use it, yeah. use it. Ain't that the truth? Um, so <laughs> my name is Jose Alanis, and um, I am a professor of um, Slavic languages and literatures at the University of Washington in Seattle. I also teach comparative literature studies, and uh, I teach a lot about comics, and I've written a couple of books about comics, including the representation of people with disabilities in superhero comics. Um, in terms of what I look like, I am a uh, Mexican-American Mexican man in his uh, early 50s. I have salt and pepper hair and beard. I wear glasses. I have my, um, my regulation uh, checkered shirt as a Gen Xer uh, issued at birth. <laughs> and uh, I also pairing it today with a Chapulín Colorado t-shirt that I got in Mexico, uh, a notable Mexican-American, Mexican superhero. Uh, I am in uh, what is usually one of our cats' rooms, so you'll see a number of uh, uh, items that are cat-specific, including a, uh, uh, some toys and a, um, a kind of a tower for them to jump around on. So that's what I am. We're also, uh, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, I am coming to you guys from the Key Peninsula in the Pacific Northwest. This is the traditional home of several tribes of the Coast Salish peoples. We are also now undergoing a terrible heat wave, um, the second of the uh, of the summer. So um, we're all trying to keep cool and trying to keep our animals alive out here in rural Washington. So uh, let me also begin by saying that uh, it is such an honor and such a such a rare privilege for me to be the one person with normate vision on this panel. Um, it is, I think, um, a testament to the um, the thoughtfulness of the organizers and how important an event like like this is. Um, why is it worth it? Why should we look at this material? I think the, the, the panelists that came before me have already articulated, I think, an important uh, part of that. Um, I guess I can add that um, it's important to look at our history, to look at the ways that, that uh, blind people have been represented um, in comics. And so what I hope to do today is to look at one particular example based on an article that I've just recently completed on Alicia Masters who is a prominent character in the Fantastic Four series, um, who happens to be blind. And uh, what comes through in the depiction of this character over the decades is the association or the linkage often made between femininity and weakness uh, uh, and dependence, um, as well as with blindness and how all of these things kind of intersect in this character uh, pretty much throughout the, uh, the first the three decades of its, uh, of its history. And then more recently, how uh, younger artists, younger creators have tried to take that inheritance, which is highly problematic and try to, um, to revise it and try to, uh, to approach this character uh, in new ways. 
um, in my opinion, sometimes carrying over some of that problematic contact. And in other cases, I think breaking important ground and, 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 and resulting in, in what is ultimately, I think, a more empowering uh, representation. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to digging a little deeper in that. Some of the things that you shared during our briefing were really impressive um, and some things I hadn't even considered. So one of the things that made me interested in um, moderating this particular panel is all about intersectionalities now. And I know as an African-American male growing up in this country, I can reflect back on how African-Americans were portrayed in the media. And, and I remember uh, as a sighted person, I became blind when I was 25. I used to enjoy the comics too. We had this cute little thing where you would take the white crayon over the comic strip and then you put it on top of a piece of paper and you could take a pencil and transfer that comic to whatever piece of paper you wanted. So we created comics using comics. We recycled them and made our own comic strips. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to know that I can probably move back into that space where I can enjoy comics again. But I remember seeing my first uh, Black superhero uh, in the comic strips and the impact that it had on me and the intersection of understanding why this is important with respect to the appropriate portrayal of people with disabilities. Uh, because in some media, you know, there wasn't the most positive portrayal of Black people on stage, on screen, et cetera. So I'm gonna to go to Sabine, who I continue to be impressed with respect to the fact that she has commitment to this as a, a art or communication form that is an authentic representation of who she is. So one of the things that the National Federation of the Blind is fighting for in broader media is that in those instances where a character within film, stage, uh, and comic strips even, uh, is portrayed by a person with a disability, um, there's plenty of talented individuals like yourself who are able to do that. Uh, can you speak to why it's so important that it's the person with the disability uh, representing that disability or creating that experience that's the, the portraying the person with the disability? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much um, for that question. And I guess um, where I'll start with that is because the work that I'm making is centered around my own experience, I have a lot of freedom from the feeling that I need to represent blindness in aggregate, um, knowing that the blind experience is like many marginalized experiences, not monolithic, right? And is a, uh, I, my experience is an additive intersectional experience of my, you know, my, my selfhood as a blind and queer woman, as a white woman coming from a, from a, the background that I come from, right? I get to, I get to represent that in a way that works for me. Comics are a unique medium in terms of the way in which, I think this has been discussed at length here, but we show and tell. And um, for me, as someone with some limited vision, my ability to show is um, nicely bracketed by what vision I have and what I like about that. Um, my interest in making really visually clear, striking, high contrast comics um, is a part of the way in which I think about representing blindness in general, both my relationship with the site that I have and my relationship with myself as a blind person in public space. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna try really hard to keep my answers to comics because I think there's, there's people on this panel with different relationships to blindness in different spaces. And uh, I, I wanna speak as directly to the kind of comics I make as I can. And I think um, anyone can make a comic. Um, it's a sort of like writing a book, right? You, there are varying degrees of access that we have to success or levels of publication or canonization, but um, inherently it's, it's a medium that is you sitting down with what you're gonna make. And I think that's, um, that's kind of a special medium to me because the roadblocks that we set up between people with disabilities and access to a sense of success in their chosen medium are uh, boundless, right? And um, so for me to be able to sit down and work in the medium of my choice and to see the vision that I have, not as a barrier to me making that, that thing that I want to make, but as a boundary around the aesthetics that I find interesting, um, I, I find that really powerful. And that that's something that really um, makes making comics uh, fun for me. 
Um, I also really like that um, the kind of comics that I make, you know, I, I make the majority of my zines by hand. I bind them by hand. There's a lot of tactile experience there and there's a lot of community there. Um, I find lots of people with different disabilities are active in um, the community of comics and zines that I find myself in and that we wind up um, doing a lot of work around collective access for each other. So um, I really try to provide access to my work in a flexible way where people can tell me what they need to engage with my work and I can make that happen in a conversational way, knowing that um, we all have you know, only so many tools at our disposal and many of our access needs bump into each other and require kind of creative solutions to navigate. Nice. Just as a follow-up based on what you just said, do you find that in that interaction and in that give and take, that there's an organic learning that takes place between you and your contemporaries that maybe enlightens them about people with disabilities and how they're being portrayed in that medium, in this medium? Absolutely. Um, I, I think that also my desire to make comics about my experience comes a lot from being read a lot of different ways in public and wanting to communicate the way I think about myself versus the way I'm read. And then, so what I really want is to be able to make that legible to community members who want to engage with what I'm making. And I don't often know off the top of my head how to make what I'm, how to make a comic accessible in the best way for someone who wants to engage with it. And so, yeah, it's been moments where someone is willing to really uh, collaborate with me in terms of their access and my understanding um, have been really powerful. Nice, but I'm sure that takes place after they get over the impact of this, this blind, low vision individual actually doing comics. So you have to have a, a skill set to put them at ease with the fact that you have that professional capacity. Sure. Yeah, yeah that, that's a, I mean, that's always a question I'm willing to speak to, but I, I try to move quickly through it, right? Because mm -hmm. the, uh, I also think it's important to talk about how not all, like, we culturally like to speak in absolutes, which means that um, a lot of the access I'm provided as a blind person is based on the assumption that I have no sight, which is not helpful to me um, and, and may not always be helpful to blind people with different types of sight or no sight, right? So um, I think that's why I find that conversational aspect and that collaborative aspect really important when we talk about access because um, I know that when I'm offered the default access for blind people, it's not always what I'm looking for. Um, and, uh, and I know that that's true for other folks trying to access my work as well. Very nice. That, thanks for sharing that. I appreciate it. Yeah. So to my friend, Joe, uh, you mentioned in some correspondence you shared with me that you're knowledgeable of the mi migration of minority, portrayal of minorities in the media, and you were associating that with blindness in the same. Can you share that with the attendees here, what you mean by that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, during my undergraduate work, uh, we studied uh, uh, different populations and how they migrate into uh, mainstream media. And uh, there was a first, the original study was done in 1969 by Clark, uh, specific. And then uh, it's been replicated for different populations. Starting, It started with race and then moved on to like LGBTQ I uh, plus populations, and I read about it in a uh, cognitive psychology of mass media by uh, Sandler, uh, or edited by Sandler. Uh, but this study, basically, or this 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 information or this research, uh, breaks it down to four stages. Uh, first, non-existence, like uh, populations are non-existence in uh, mainstream media or in media. Uh, then uh, moves to ridicule, so being made fun of, made a joke, uh, used as humor, uh, uh, kind of slapstick, all the above. Uh, after that point, it moves into regulation. And uh, regulation might not be what most people think about, but if you look at a lot of media and you look at different populations, how they're first represented in media in a respect, somewhat respectful way, they're provided uh, parts or, and often professions that automatically give them respect, like judge, lawyer, police officer, all these types of roles that bring authority. Uh, so they put these, these populations into those roles. And I, I think you can look back at many roles. After uh, that regulation stage, we move into a uh, full range of uh, roles and respect. And I, I would say in disability realm, we're not there yet. I, I think we're just cracking the door open uh, and just just kind of forcing the door open in that realm. Uh, but uh, 
uh, you know, there are definitely some big bounds being made, or maybe just those are normal size bounds being made. But you can look back through all kinds of different populations uh, and uh, and kind of look through those stages and see how they attribute. And, and I definitely see it in the world of blindness uh, and, and in those portrayals, but also how those the, the parts for actors who are blind or low vision. And, and you know, I've worked with, I don't know, close to, uh, I don't know, 60 actors uh, professionally, like in film who are blind or low vision uh, in parts and roles and, you know, in television and such. And I've worked with hundreds who have auditioned and gone through the process. And I, I get to, for my show, I get to review every audition that comes through the showrunner uh, for our show and myself review every audition uh, that when we, we break down the parts uh, to figure out who is the best person for that part. Uh, and there are always people who are blind or low vision in that, in that realm. And, uh, but uh, sometimes they're not the right person for the part, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 yeah. Yeah. So you, you answered the question that spared me. You say we're not quite at stage four yet. So I'm assuming you feel we're at stage three. I, I would say we're in stage three. Like, so, so I, what, I was, is it, what is it going to yeah. take to get us to stage four? I, I think like the door is opening. And, and if you look at even other populations, uh, not just the disability community, I would say the LGBTQI uh, plus population is still not in totally in a full range of roles. Like uh, it's, it's getting there. It's a lot, a lot further along than the disability community, but the disability community has a lot farther to go. And I, I think we're, you're, I think getting the voices of people, persons with disabilities, persons who are blind or low vision, who get their own shows or creating their shows, writing their shows, where they're the leading that show is the most important thing. And I know people doing that. I know people, uh, a director and writer who uh, created a feature film out of the UK, uh, Adam Morris. I, I know other people who are legally blind who are, who've just been greenlit on TV shows and it's happening but we're, we're just not there yet. And I think the more success you see from those people, uh, the more, and, and the more they get to represent the full range out there and, and they're creating that, that narrative. And it doesn't even just have to be about disability or blindness, but it, it's nice to have some of that perspective in the world uh, uh, in those parts they're creating or the stories they're telling. Mm -hmm. So do you think we'll oh, get to stage four? I think so. I, mm -hmm. I think so. I think, I think we still have a ways to go. Um, I, I think uh, there, there are, I can tell you my foot's in the door and, uh, and I, I feel like I, I'm going to have some opportunities. I know others who, who have opportunities who are going to be able to, and if we can help other people get those opportunities, I, I think that's so important. And I forgot to say, I'm a white male with a beard, a, a thick beard. I have long hair that goes down to, uh, I guess, my chest. I have uh, a t-shirt on and I have no clue what color it is right at the moment. <laughs> And I have a horrible mask tan from being outside in the sun every day. Yep. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. So, so Jose, it seems like um, Joe has kind of provided the schematic of those four stages. And with your expertise and all the research you've done in the portrayal of people with disabilities in comics, can you uh, share with our uh, participants some of the things that you've learned? And, and can you share whether the portrayal of people with disabilities has progressed through those stages that Joe kind of outlined? Yes, I'm happy to do that. I'm trying to share my screen since I did mm -hmm. have some images. Um, so let's see if that works. It says you're share, sharing your screen. Is that coming through? Hi, Jose. Yeah, I can see that. It's not in presentation mode yet. Okay, thank you. Let me put this up here. So you should be seeing an image of uh, Alicia Masters from Fantastic Four. Um, hopefully that'll that'll queue up if it hasn't. So yes, thank you, um, Anil. In, indeed, I think uh, Joseph sets up I think, you, a very useful- Let me interrupt you just really quickly. Can you give kind of an audio description of what's on the screen? Because I, I can't see it and I'm not- Yes, yes. I, so what you see on the screen is a drawing of a woman uh, who is blonde and uh, sitting in a studio. Um, she is an artist and she has a bust of a um, superhero named Ben Grimm, the thing, uh, next to her. And um, it is an image of Alicia Masters, who I will talk about um, just now. But I um, wanted to, to, yes, to appreciate J uh, Joseph setting up those, uh, those parameters. I, I, I would say that 
um, those four stages don't necessarily operate in uh, in discrete kind of order, right? Like you can have um, sure. some of them overlapping. You can have uh, sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, uh, going backward as well as forward. It's it's kind of like uh, 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 Kubler Ross's uh, stages of grief uh, and death, yeah. right? Like they they don't necessarily operate uh, in, in in any kind of necessarily sequence. But of course, the 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 general mode is to um, to go in in in, uh, in the attitude of progress. Alicia Masters was introduced uh, in 1962 in the Marvel uh, superhero series, The Fantastic Four. The Fantastic Four, as you probably know, was a uh, central pillar in the Marvel revolution of the early 1960s, the so-called Silver Age. And so one of the characteristics of that uh, era was, uh, and one of the innovations that Jack Kirby and Stan Lee introduced at that time was, was putting in more people with disabilities, including the major characters. Um, Alicia Masters is not one of the major characters, but she is the, uh, the, the romantic interest of one of them, Ben Grimm, uh, the thing. And she is introduced in 1962, as I say, as the blind daughter of a supervillain. I'm not gonna go into all of the different details, but um, as you can see here in this image from, um, or as, as I'm showing on the slide, in this image from 1962, um, she is portrayed as a kind of weak, weak person uh, in this page. She is trying to prevent her father, uh, the villainous puppet master from his schemes. And she basically is shown stumbling into him and uh, inadvertently causing him to fall out of a window. So there's oh. almost an element of, uh, of Pratt falling uh, kind of a villain comedy uh, yeah. that, is, uh, that is baked into this, uh, this sequence. She is not represented as any kind of uh, a powerful figure, even though of course she she defeats the villain, it's more of a uh, a bumbling uh, kind of uh, of demeanor that she is presented with. So the association, right, as Joseph Joseph pointed out earlier, of uh, representing these marginalized groups as objects of ridicule or objects of pity um, was very much in uh, in operation at this early time. Now that said, right. There is an important uh, element here that that Kirby and uh, and Lee are are introducing, which is that we are able to actually um, enter into uh, their 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 representation of what a um, an independent uh, artist who happens to be blind uh, is uh, is is like. Um, there's another element of Alicia Masters' uh, representation, and you can see it here in this image from um, that I have on the slide. Um, which is uh, showing Alicia Masters' sculptures, which are sculptures of various Marvel villains, including the Mole Man, who is a man with uh, distorted features, who also, by the way, happens to be blind, um, Dr. Doom, who is a man in, in armor, and uh, some squirrels who are alien creatures, and they're all being uh, gazed over by the Fantastic Four, three members of the Fantastic Four, in this issue, uh, in this image from January of 1963. And they point out that Alicia is such a remarkably sensitive artist and, and person because of her blindness that she is actually able to represent these uh, fearsome villains in, uh, in particularly um, uh, almost frightening lifelike ways as they are described. There, there's of course a kind of a paradox here, right? How could Alicia actually represent these figures if she could not physically touch them? But, but it, it gets at, again, the kind of uh, the absurdity of, of some of these portrayals that she is so sensitive that she can almost telepathically channel uh, these uh, figures appearance into her work as a sculptress. Finally, uh, before I, I pause, um, I wanted to show just one important facet of the character given that in arguably the most important story of the 1960s in the Marvel series, The Fantastic Four, the series that introduces Galactus and the, uh, and the Silver Surfer, it is left to Alicia, uh, not the superheroes, but Alicia to save the planet Earth. And so you see here two panels uh, from The Fantastic Four, number 49, April 1966, which shows Alicia, uh, the blonde woman, uh, pleading with the uh, Silver Surfer by kind of uh, banging on his chest and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and pleading very close up to his face for, the, uh, for mercy for the planet Earth because uh, she feels that uh, they have no right to take away um, their planet since their intention is to destroy the planet. And at one point she says, we live, breathe, feel, can't you see that? Are you as blind as I? Um, mm. So I, I guess the, the, the most generous 
uh, thing you can say about this type of representation is that it, it kind of cuts both ways. It, it gives uh, obviously a very um, incomplete and very skewed image of Alicia as a, a weak and even simpering figure. At the same time, it, 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 it instills her with such humanity, if you will, that she is able to, uh, to represent the entire planet Earth uh, in the face of destruction and actually succeeds in saving the planet Earth. All of this is part of the, uh, the contradictions and paradoxes that are often involved in superhero comics. Yeah, and, and also very reflective of real life, right? I mean, it, it's not as easy as we would think. Life is complicated and living as a person with a disability, a lot of that, those just physicians come into play in every day. And the important thing, of course, and this is obvious, is that these are all, this is a, a cited culture's representation of a blind person. That's, of course, the, uh, that's the problem. Yeah. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Um, so, Joe, I'm going to come back to you. Um, Sabine mentioned earlier, and I love the fact that she's just so authentic, right? She's representing herself in, in her work. But you just um, listed a whole body of collaboration where it's not about Joe Streche as the blind guy. So as you're consulting on these different projects, how do you balance not making every depiction of blindness based on your lived experience? Because, you know, within the, the, the category of blindness, there's so many different individualized lived experiences. How do you balance that? That's a great question, I know. Uh, well, basically, my, my graduate work is around blindness. I've uh, basically like three masters around blindness. I've worked uh, in multiple states where I taught people how to travel, people who are blind or low vision, uh, in New Jersey, in New York City. Uh, I taught children or high school students in New York City who are blind or low vision, uh, state of Florida as well, and worked at Florida State University. And I, I've worked with about, I, I don't know, a thousand or thousands of people who are blind or low vision. I played a Paralympic sport uh, where I was uh, worked with a lot of people, or uh, played sports with other people who are blind or low vision. But so I've worked professionally with people who are blind or low vision. I've also had the lived experience. My mom is also uh, blind as well. Uh, you know, so I don't use just my, my experience, but I also do the research. So when I'm talking about a specific portrayal, I look at the age of vision loss, if they lose their vision uh, or if they were born blind. I look at that, I, I work on the, the science around it through all the journal articles, thinking about what those implications would be specific to that character. Every character that I work with, whether it was uh, the child version of Matt Murdock, because uh, Matt Murdock lost his vision around nine or 10 years old, uh, you know, I, that, that helped, uh, helped me determine what the portrayal of Charlie, well, uh, portrayal of uh, Matt Murdock in the Netflix show would be like. It, it wasn't specific to the comic book, it was specific to the research. And then when you look at uh, Britt Marling's character in the OA, I specifically looked at the age of vision loss uh, in the show I work on uh, now, which is, you know, it's totally science fiction. A viral apocalypse happened somewhere between now and uh, maybe a, a hundred or 200 years from now. And wow, viral apocalypse, that, that, that could never happen, right? Uh, so this virus <laughs> happens and kills off the majority of population of Earth. And uh, uh, the, the people that live emerge blind. And then our show takes place uh, hundreds of years out uh, later as different uh, civilizations have built out different. And you'll see more of that in August 27th when season two comes out. And uh, I'm currently working on and season spoiler three. Spoiler alert, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More to come, more to yeah. come. But uh, so, I, and you know, in our current show, the social norms and visual and cultural norms of eye contact disappear. After hundreds of years of not, having sight and in a world where the value of sight is, is non-existent, uh, eye contact disappears. If you go to different parts of the world, currently eye contact is valued in different ways. Uh, so we take, I took things like that and built it into our show. Um, and so it's what I, what I use uh, is often research-based, you know, it, but also depending on, on the storyline, I'm not writing all the stories, but as we, we move through this process, um, my experience and experiences of others, like when people are climbing mountains or cliffs, I, I, I call my buddy Eric Weinmeier and he, he sends me videos of his climbing. And I, I have some other friends in Europe who are climbers who are totally blind. 
And I, you know, when I have people who are doing very specific things, it's just not only my perspective. And, and I have a core group of people I reach out to here and there uh, when I have specific questions uh, to make sure. And it's a very diverse group, I would tell you, uh, of people that I, I reach out to because I want to make sure I'm not just representing myself. And, and I do have to make decisions about what it'll be and, and, and try to justify them and, and explain them. And I know I'll be asked about them. So I, I take it very seriously. Seriously, it's a it's a big responsibility, and you know, and our, our actors who are blind or low vision that come into each one of our seasons uh, have their opportunity to bring their spin to that world. Uh, you know, yeah. Great. I'm I'm going to come back with the follow, but I want to go to Sabine as yeah. kind of a juxtaposition. So representing yourself does give you that ability to say that this is my lived experience, but I gotta believe that sometimes you run into other blind or low vision individuals that either you know, can resonate with what you're putting out there or say that this is not uh, a true authentic blind experience. Do you, does that happen to you? And if so, how do you deal with that? That's a really interesting question. So I guess I'll start by saying like, for me, it's important that I call myself blind and I, I don't mind being referred to as low vision, but I don't really like to, allow too much space for people to adjudicate my experience of, of visual processing as a part of whether my experience is or isn't legitimate. Um, and I, I, that's, so that piece of language is important to me. I will say no blind person has ever like consumed my work and told me that I wasn't really blind, right? That is something that sighted people do um, <laughs> with regards to my work for sure. And, and bring sort of to my, to my doorstep, this question of, why and how I might make visual work or visually focused work um, as a blind person. Um, and and I have I have some space to, to speak to that, but I'm not gonna spend too much time on it here. Um, one thing I will say is that um, with regards to um, what was discussed around um, the sort of evolution of representation and the ways in which we kind of hope to see people with disabilities portrayed versus how they are portrayed. I think people with disabilities are sort of uniquely stuck in, um, in fiction uh, in being portrayed as symbols, um, maybe more so than any other group, right? We, we see the symbolic absence, as a culture, we're very interested in the symbolic absence of a sense or an ability as being a literary device. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a big reason why I uh, make nonfiction. I, I feel I have a lot more control over what I'm trying to say and what I know. Um, and it allows me to, to give sort of what I feel is a truthful um, account of my experience without getting bogged down in blind person as all seeing seer, right? Like the these tropes that we see coming up with disabled bodies in fictional media uh, perpetrated by able-bodied creators, but also, you know, just sort of generally adopted in ways that I think are pretty pervasive and pretty difficult to unpack. Um, I, I find nonfiction to be a good side door um, where I can be focused, um, not on like truth telling, right? I made some air quotes there, um, but just on, on, focusing on what I know and what I find interesting about um, my own experiences and the experiences of people I feel comfortable speaking for and about versus um, allowing myself to be sort of subsumed by this narrative of a uh, the, the, the symbolic value of a blind person in a fictional narrative. So I'm gonna ask, cause you touched on this too. I'm gonna ask you and Joe to kind of expound on when you're dealing with people's perception of your authentic representation of people with disabilities, I mean, that's got to be challenging, right? Because you're dealing with the historic uh, perception, you know, that people exist. It, it's reinforced through our everyday with people living with those misconceptions around, you know, the capacity of people with disabilities. And now you're in this place where you're trying to justify that you, you are an authority. It seems like it would be kind of obvious since you are an actual person with a disability, but I got to believe it's a little bit more difficult than that. I think um, actually what Jose uh, talks about with regards to Alicia Masters and her impact on interpretations of blindness overall and, and sort of the uh, historical 
moves that we have or haven't made around interpretations of blindness that shows up in my real life with regards to my work quite a lot right so when we see lots of representations of blind women as objects of pity as sort of nice bringers of uh truth with relation to the very vulnerable um or as like a representation of the the most sort of pure or um pitiful body you can imagine and again alicia masters also um if you are not cited while we're looking at those images is like conventionally beautiful um so all of that information wraps up in uh a cultural imaginary of what a blind woman is and that's something that i'm bumping up against when i make work right and i'm very aware of that um and I don't find it particularly interesting to address that head on. I, I have things that I'd rather talk about in my work, I think, but but I'm aware of it. And I think part of what comics lets you do is be in conversation with the whole medium of comics while being very specific with your style and your narrative choices about what parts of it you want to take in and what parts of it you'd like to leave behind. And so I think knowing that there's that history, right, of, of portrayals of blindness and particularly blind women, people who are blind being totally blind, things like that. That's all subtext for the work that I'm making. And I have to kind of either directly or indirectly take that on when I think about work that I'm making. Right. So I imagine it's a skill that you have to acquire if you're going to be successful in the work that you do. But, but based on, Joe, based on what uh, Sabine was just offering, all of that you know, the portrayal of people with disabilities mm-hmm. in the media and if the room long before you do, right? To all those other people that are working yep. with you in conjunction to put this work together, come to the table with that pre-existing perception. How, how do you deal with it? So I, I get to choose my work, right? Like, so I have the opportunity to choose what I work on. And, uh, you know, I, I will only work on a project where I believe, you uh, the the people and the, and the properties are respectful to blindness and you know they're not all created equal there are so many projects that i have been provided scripts to or asked to consult on and uh that i i, I read through it and i provide my feedback and and possibly they don't like my feedback or i just i'm just like there's no way i want to be any part of this project uh you know most are created by people who are not blind or low vision have had very little action, uh, interaction to people who are blind or low vision. Uh, and then their the stories have all kinds of narratives that are just mistaken. And, um, and, and just in that ridicule world, even I, I, you know, I come across comedies and other things and I'm like, I do not want to be a part of that. That's not the story I want to help tell. I, I want to make sure that we're shown like for my show and I, and, you know, our, our show, uh, that I work on for Apple TV Plus C, uh, you know, we do have uh, some of those more common, like special abilities in some ways, but it, it, I would say it's a science fiction show, as I keep saying. But uh, also, I would say that we have people that are warriors, villains, romantic interests that are parents doing all kinds of professions. And you don't see people doing professions, persons with disabilities, persons who are blind, especially. We, you don't see them doing jobs, everyday life, like carpentry. You don't see them doing metal work. You don't see all that. And I've been able to, in my show, to, to bring in people who actually really do that work to do, do stuff on our show, be part of our show, uh, whether portray it, but also, you know, to represent that because I want to see that in the world. And, and we don't see it. Think about all the portrayals you see in the media and what what, what activities you see those people do. It's very limited. And, uh, and, and that means something to me. If I had the opportunity to work on a project where I can show people who are blind doing stuff that most people don't think about uh, and, or don't believe. And it's funny because some of my, the people who I know who are blind or low vision talk to me, uh, they, they'll say, you're not the typical person who's blind. Like I, I, I do rock climbing and, and, and bouldering. I'm like, I know so many more people that are like, you know, Eric and other people who climb all the time. You know, I can, I can do a little climbing. I'm not Eric or, or these other people, but like to say, because I go hiking and go through nature and I, uh, I, you know, I, I'm willing to uh, put, and I, Anil, you're 
you're definitely one of those people. And, and I'm sure every one of us on this is one of those people. But yeah. it's funny how many of the people in our own population and community have bought into what what limiting factors has been presented about us over the years. Yeah. What, what typical quote, unquote. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm going to come to you, Jose. Um, again, Sabine offered another interesting dynamic. She says she likes to focus on nonfiction. Um, have, have you in your research seen a difference as to whether the portrayal of people with disabilities is offered better in nonfictional or fictional works? Yes, thank you. I'm uh, once again trying to share my screen. Um, is that showing up for you all? Yep, thanks Jose. Thank you. So um, yes, there, there is, I think, a, um, a, a difference and that, that, that's what I think is important about studying the histories of, uh, of these characters, that, that they don't stay static. Um, and that of course, uh, in the case of Alicia Masters who has been around almost 60 years, uh, you do see changes um, over time and so, if you compare, for example, the her representation in the early the 60s, pretty much throughout the, the 20th century, to what's going on in the last couple of decades, here's an example that I have on my slide by Dan Slott and Andrea DeVito from a series called The Thing from 2006. It shows Alicia Masters, a blonde woman, sitting in her bathrobe at her in a very, very palatial and uh, pretty luxurious uh, New York apartment. Uh, that's got to cost a lot to have an apartment like that in New York City. <laughs> and come and up, she's man. sitting at a breakfast table and she is reading Braille and you have a panel that shows her fingers tracing the Braille uh, and then you have uh, a kind of additional panel, kind of a sub panel that, that gives you a visualization of what the Braille is saying. So this is of course still a, um, uh, a comic book obviously meant for a sighted audience, but you get uh, some sense of her as a blind person uh, doing something that is, um, you know, typical and, and, and normal and living kind of an everyday life. One other thing that, that I was going to say, though, is that even as you look at uh, some of these more recent representations that I will discuss in brief, um, you do still see some, some carryover. The idea that while Alicia Masters is independent, she is wealthy, she is living in this particular story uh, apart from the Fantastic Four because she and the thing have broken up. So, and she has a whole other relationship. And so she's uh, pretty much uh, autonomous and, and lives her own life and lives a very fulfilled life. She is still represented through what, is, and this is something I think that came up when Sabine uh, was speaking for me is the, the, the visual typage, right? That occurs, the ways that there are certain visual markers of blindness that cartoonists to this present day have, you know, have inherited. And, and it's always a choice as Sabine was saying, whether you want wants to kind of engage with those or wants to, wants to react against them. In the case of blind people, and in the case of Alicia Masters in particular, that um, visual marker of her blindness is signified by the blank eye irises. So she ha she'll have these kind of blank eyes. Now that's different, by the way, from Matt Murdock, who is the other major blind character of the 1960s in Marvel, who's also Daredevil. Um, his blindness is signaled by dark glasses. And I think, of course, there's a very strong uh, gendered obviously approach here to, to what um, is, is gonna be used for a man versus a woman who is blind. So, but that, and that continues right into the 21st century. I sh uh, uh, on my next slide, I have a panel from a story from 2016 by Dan Slott and Mike Allred called Silver Surfer Volume Four, Citizen of Earth, which shows, uh, again, I think another uh, very, very different take on Alicia who is no longer stumbling and bumbling in fact in this story, she is able to, to combat supervillains directly. We show her here um, confronting a supervillain who is floating in the, uh, in the air, another woman with a cape. And, um, and so as, you, uh, as, as signified here uh, by her blank uh, uh, irises, uh, she is still blind, but she is holding on her, to her cane as a, uh, as a billy club. In fact, this is a cane that is given to her as a gift by Matt Murdock, her friend, who is of course also a daredevil which can also be turned into a billy club like his weapon. So, so there, there's a lot of, of course, intertext, uh, intertextual um, uh, factors here to, to take into account. That said, right, there is also this um, recursive uh, means by which she is being shown uh, that, that actually ties into the, the, you know, the long legacy of more dehumanized depiction of blind people in comics because she is not staring directly at the villain. She is utilizing 
what the comics, uh, sorry, the cinema historian Jason Chu calls the blind gaze. Mm. The blind gaze often being directed away from the um, from the main action, so to speak, yeah. right? And, the, and of course, this is this has particular um, ramifications for how uh, she is seen as uh, powerful or or or, or less in power. Um, Finally, I, I just wanted to, to turn to the uh, very recent representation of Alicia Masters, uh, because in 2019, she married Ben Grimm, the thing, who is, of course, uh, one of the founding members of the Fantastic Four. And so what you see, uh, what you have on this slide here is a Jewish wedding, in which we're shown uh, Ben Grimm, the thing, uh, in traditional Jewish uh, wedding dress with a yarmulke. He is about mm -hmm. to smash the, uh, the glass on the, on the floor. And uh, they're in a hoofah there, and uh, and you see Alicia Masters uh, in her wedding gown. And, and again, right, arguably this art by Carlos Pacheco is also highlighting uh, what Jason Chu might call the blind gaze, um, in that she is looking off into what some might consider an uh, an irrelevant part of the uh, of the space. So anyway, so so there are all sorts of, of complexities. It seems to me, right? Alicia Masters is a modern woman. She has a career. She has all sorts of of, of uh, fulfillments in her life. At the same time, they're just in, in the ways that she is represented visually, there's still a lot of um, kind of um, uh, inheritances from the past that are being continued. Oh, Anil, you also asked about the, uh, the about nonfiction and I just very briefly want mm -hmm. to highlight one, I think rather remarkable work, Annie Sullivan and the Trials of Helen Keller by Joseph Lambert, which is a biography of these two important um, women in the history of uh, blind people in America, um, and it does uh, really extraordinary things. So the cover shows Annie Sullivan, who is a uh, young woman in her 20s, and, uh, and, and the child Helen Keller sitting in a tree, and they are working on what looks like maybe some braille, uh, a book of braille together. Uh, and this is, of course, in the, uh, the late 19th, early 20th century. And so what the book uh, explores is, uh, in particular, the, um, the sensation, right, the, the, the ways in which uh, comics can find particular techniques and visual correlates to the experience of being a blind deaf person like Helen Keller. Mm -hmm. And so in this final slide, you see a series of eight panels in which Lambert depicts um, Helen Keller uh, holding a glass of water. It, uh, it shows a hand with a, gl with a glass that says the word water and how that glass in the next panel shifts into her head. And so the idea of her drinking the water and then having the concept of water in her head. The next panel shows the, uh, the, um, the ways in which you can sign the word water uh, in her head with the word water. So there's these associations being made between language, perception, and her particular ontology and subjectivity as a, as a blind person. And so um, the, the, the page goes on to kind of make those, um, those connections very, very visually concrete in, in a way that's really unprecedented in, in, uh, in, um, in comics. Um, I will close simply by saying that there's of course a supreme irony here, and this is pointed out by Charles Hatfield, the comic scholar. There's a supreme irony in the fact that we are finding visual correlates for of course what is a non-visual um, uh, idea, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is again, um, part and parcel, right, of, of, of this particular approach of the representing the blind experience from a sighted perspective that, of course, get, runs us into maybe some of the problems that Sabine was pointing out before. Thank do, you. Do, do, you find, do you find it, well, I can't say easier. Um, I, I'll say more, in, well, I <laughs> can't say more in line with reality. Uh, so you, you just gave two examples of how disability is uh, portrayed, one in a fictional context and the other in a non-fictional context. Um, I would imagine, you know, the, the, the non-fiction gives you license and ability to kind of imagine and project where the, the I'm sorry, fiction gives you the opportunity and non-fiction kind of maybe anchors you to trying to at least represent what is considered reality. Do you find that in the use of comics, one kind of serves us better when we're trying to promote that forward thinking, proactive, positive um, perception of disability? I think very briefly, um, I think coming, and I think actually this is a great question for the whole panel, but I think in the case of Annie Sullivan and the Trials of Helen Keller by Joseph Lambert, um, 
at least for me as a reader, I, I never forget the fact that, of course, these are real people. <laughs> they, they, this is not a made-up story. Uh, of course, he takes dramatic licenses, and he's you know doing, um, and, and maybe the greatest dramatic license is to actually do these techniques where you kind of are are, are creating these visual um, parallels to to what is, of course, a very subjective experience of being deaf blind, um, which is of course you know uh, completely um, from a sighted perspective, right? And and um, but, but yes, I think just the fact that um, if we're gonna talk about representation and we're, we're gonna talk about you know, real people in American and, and, and world history who are blind, to just have them show up and to have them treated with such humanity, right, um, is, uh, is really extraordinary. Um, I can't recommend the book enough. Thank you for sharing that. So I'm gonna pitch it back to the other members. So Sabine, you, you mentioned you know, uh, fiction is, is your choice. Right. So do you do that consciously because it gives you more freedom or th is the other alternative more restrictive? Is um, I, I really like making nonfiction because I'm interested in the world and my place oh, in sorry, it. I misinterpreted then. Oh, nonfiction. Okay. okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I don't fuck yeah. with fiction. Um, I'm very happy for people who enjoy making it. I don't I don't I'm not particularly interested in building a world. And I feel like there are other hang ups in fiction that I'm not particularly interested in engaging with um, from the sort of symbolic disabled body that I talked about earlier to mm -hmm. the construction of worlds. And I think something we've, as a culture, started to reckon with a little bit more lately, and this is a bit of a tangent, but like, is the, the idea that like, when we build fantasy worlds or science fiction worlds, we often reinscribe the same uh, oppressive dynamics into those worlds. And I, I think a good example of that that I think about a lot is a, uh, an article, I don't remember its source now, around the time that Game of Thrones was popular, that was, I'm gonna reference sexual assault here. Um, an article that was like, this is a fantasy world that includes dragons and we can't imagine it not like just centralizing rape also, right? Um, so for me, I, I don't, I, I consume plenty of fiction, but I, I'm not really interested in making it um, and I am particularly interested in um, making visible the ways in which I interact with the world. Um, I'm a very in public person. I have lots of jobs and lots of interests that take me lots of places. And I find that people sighted and uh, other disabled people have a variety of reactions to me in public and a variety of types of interactions with me. Um, I'm very interested in that and so, you know, uh, knowing that you know we all have multiple uh, limited number of hours in the day, I, I like to <laughs> to spend my hours making that kind of work that interests me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my my focal point is definitely on um, uh, sort of locating the site at which my body and public space bump into each other, either literally or in terms of. Um, the way a space is designed, who's welcome in it, um, how I'm going to interact with the built environment or the community around me. Um, that, that's, that's, where, that's where my interest sits for sure. Thank you, thank you. So I guess the way I was framing the question for you is probably more appropriate to Joe because you do end up in those areas where you have to imagine more, do more creativity or, or build those worlds like Sabine was saying. Do, do you find that to be more liberating or is it more challenging? Do you base what you're doing on more a reality context? I, I definitely use a lot of reality in my uh, fiction, but I, I think it's both. It depends on what kind of story it is, who's telling the story, um, where, where the story's going. And, uh, you know, uh, but there are, I use more reality to create that though, uh, for the background, but then, uh, it depends where that, that particular story is going. Most of the stories I've worked on are fiction and whether they are uh, like true li more true life fiction or science fiction. I've done plenty of science fiction, obviously. Uh, but uh, I, I, I like both. I, I like the creativity of fiction for sure. Like uh, I like that we get to create aspects that are not uh, written on the page originally and, uh, or we get to expand what's written uh, to to show different things and it, it that excites me but I I, I, I love nonfiction as well I read a lot and uh, uh, it's there are definitely so many nonfiction stories that I would love to tell 
uh, or help tell the future. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have to admit that that the work in fiction, nonfiction, I just find it extremely creative. And um, mm-hmm. I, I know that uh, Sabin, Sabine said anybody could do it, but I, I find myself woefully inadequate to do some of those things that we've already discussed. Um, I offer this general question um, to the whole group before we open up for Q&A. And it's kind of nuanced because we've already kind of touched on it. But again, um, societal perception of, of people with disabilities, again, we're not at stage four. Uh, and it's pervasive. I think that the majority of people, unfortunately, don't believe that people with disabilities have the capacity. They don't see us as contemporaries or as equals. And all of that comes into this space, you know, as we try to interact and try to produce and work in this space. Um, how, how, do we, how do we fight that? How do we, no, more specifically, in the realm of comics, a lot of what happens is, as, as Jose just portrayed, an interpretation of the panels, right? But if a person already has that pre-existing perception of incapacity, right? How, how do we keep them from interpreting our work from that ableist perspective? How, how do they get it? How do we make sure they get it? Maybe it's a little difficult. I'll offer some clarity. One of the previous panels, uh, one of the ladies answered the question about when we're making comics accessible, we have to make them in a way that the information is put, presented so that the person who's reading it through that non-visual means is able to come to that epiphany or that conclusion, not be told what it means, but be able to come to that themselves. How do we do that when we're faced with that pre-existing ableist mentality? I, I think this is Joe. I, I think more and more having people whose authentic voice is out there, whether you know the, the individuals on these panels and uh, on this panel and uh, and many other people I know out there in the world, getting more and more people to uh, allow their voice to be out there and allow them to help create those stories and share them, whether in comics or any other kind of media. I, I think that's what's going to change perception, and right. and 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 then getting the public to to buy into that, you know, and uh, the public to and and I think that really, I think the media has an opportunity to change perception, but uh, it, it, we're uh, as you said, we're nowhere nowhere near there. We're 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 maybe in stage three, but just as said before, we we go back and forth. Uh, right. There's no no straightforward. Uh, Right. And then offer a little clarity. The panel I was referring to then was like in the description of the the comic, uh, the panels in the comics, like the one that Jose was describing. Of course, he understands disability from a different perspective. So he can look at that picture and glean something, you know, in a way that we would want. But most people don't come from that pre-existing knowledge or perception that people with disabilities have capacity. How, How do we, how do we, and maybe it's not something that can be answered. Maybe this is more research that needs to be conducted, but I was wondering whether either of you had any, any ideas of how we do that. If I can maybe offer, offer something, I think um, in the case of a character like Alicia Masters, who has mm-hmm. been around, like I said, since 1962, and who a lot of us grew up with <laughs> reading Marvel comics, um, I think it, it can, uh, it, it can really affect, I think, uh, at least some readers to see this character change and evolve and the way that her representation is both reflecting, you know, a post ADA maybe kind of culture uh, in the United States, um, as well as maybe, uh, you know, certain strides that feminism has made and, and just certain things that are just not really, um, you can't really do Alicia Masters the way she was done in the 60s anymore. Right, so I guess that that's a sort of progress. Um, yeah. On the other hand, like 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 I was trying to say, that the, the picture is is complex. The last thing I would say is that I think it would be remiss of me as a literature professor to not also point out that I don't think it's it's categories like fiction and nonfiction are necessarily discrete. I think very often they can blur into each other, yeah. and one could say that. That no was obvious based on my my me asking the question. Yeah. It was obvious that it blurs. <laughs> That representation, <laughs> even self-representation, is a kind of, 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 of recreation, right? It is a kind of, in a sense, putting mm-hmm. on the page, which to me, is for, for Sabine, I think in, in your work, uh, if I could just sort of slide a question in here, is, is whether 
there, there is a way in, in just your own practice as you touched on, but just particularly in your own self portraits that you are grappling with the history of, you know, the, uh, the cartoon representation of, 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 of disabled people and of blind people in particular. I mean, I, I certainly think that you're challenging a lot of that in reverse flaneur and in the, the fashions that you kind of show yourself wearing or the, the ways that you interact with people on the street, like, like flipping off a, a cat collar or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, but, but I, I'm curious how you kind of came to these representations. And an extension of that, is that your intent and are you being intentional uh, yeah. in that work? Okay. <laughs> I sure am. <laughs> To, to yeah. change perceptions of people with disabilities? I mean, maybe. So I think Jose is is maybe, um, so thanks Jose for that really sweet question related to, to my work. And um, I, I think Jose is asking that question because he kind of knows the answer, which is that it's intentional <laughs> on a personal level and sort of on a community level, right? Um, similar to what Joe brings up, like I'm not trying to say that my experience of blindness is in any way represent representative of anybody's. But if um, if someone's only idea of what a blind lady looks like is Alicia Masters, obviously that's not necessarily the case, but I think I'm often the only blind lady in the room and I don't care for that. That's not ideal for me. Um, that's not um, the world that I necessarily wanna be in. And so, one way in which I think I can deal with that is drawing myself, looking cool, cruising around town, engaging with public space, engaging with the community, um, being creative and maybe, um, like you say, fiction, nonfiction, blurring, like being um, creative in the visual ways I represent the experiences that I have and how I want to make it clear that the narrative that someone else might be projecting in terms of what they see of me in public is not the narrative that I'm experiencing, right? When we see someone on the street who is having an experience we don't understand um, or embodying a disability that we can't imagine embodying, we make a lot of assumptions. And I think um, I, I think I grapple with my self-image in a fun way that I really enjoy as a part of kind of talking about like one way in which you can see a blind person as a whole person. Um, and uh, and I definitely also like as someone whose access to my self image is limited to the vision that I have. Um, I really enjoy drawing myself and thinking about the way that I look and um, thinking about the control that I have over my own image when I draw myself. Um, that's something that that is really valuable to me. Nice. Th thank you very much for sharing that. I appreciate that. And I, I, and I, I've been a bad <laughs> moderator. You've been great, but I think no. Jose had something. This is Emily. I just want to make sure everyone knows. Yeah, the Q and A. <laughs> yeah, we're coming up on time. That's what I was saying. I've been a bad moderator. I'm sorry. Let, let's try to take as many questions as we can. I think we have maybe four minutes. You've been a wonderful moderator. Um, somebody asked, uh, inspired by Jose's discussion of Alicia Masters reading Braille, does anyone know of an extended sequence in the comics that depicts Braille reading? Wondering about sustained depictions of reading tactile, actual depictions of reading with the fingertips. I think I think that question was asked by Charles Hatfield, whom I mentioned earlier and whom I quoted. Um, apart from Annie Sullivan in *The Trials of Helen Keller*, I, I don't I don't really I, I can't think of any myself. Not off the top of my head, but it could be out there. Um, I'll, I'll keep an eye out. Extended, I, I don't know extended, but in Marvel's Daredevil, definitely Matt Murdock uh, reads Braille in the comics, but I, I don't know how we define extended. So I, I wouldn't say extended. It's I, probably I like a frame or two. The comics, yeah, are also very much about like getting information across in an efficient manner. Yeah. So just like you don't often see multiple panels of someone reading a book, I yeah. think it is probably unlikely unless the subject of the work yeah. was on learning Braille or engaging with Braille. Sure. Like we just don't see a lot of like pages yeah. of Matt Murdock reading mm -hmm. or Spider-Man no. reading yeah. Um, yeah, sure. in whatever format. As a, as a Marvel zombie, I would also point out that because Matt Murdock is a superhero, has superpowers, he actually can read the actual newspaper with his fingers. Uh, <laughs> <not> <laughs> sure. <just> <laughs> 
in that room. Yeah. Um, Daniel another, Kishkin. <laughs> another question that was asked was about um, how blind people, especially blind wo women, are often paired with some character that are viewed by society as aesthetically displeasing, like uh, the thing in Fantastic Four. Um, the <laughs> participant who raised it was saying that they really dislike that, but I'm wondering how you all feel about that. Is that uh, a negative trait or is that disability community? I'm not a panelist, but I, I went right to uh, Beauty and the Beast and you know she wasn't blind, <laughs> so yeah. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm dismissing. No, it, it, well, this is a uh, a, um, a pretty archetypal, actually, a way in which Alicia Masters and and Ben Grimm are are paired. Uh, you can go back to the um, uh, the movie by um, uh, the uh, the Man Who Laughs, which is a, a classic film of the, the 1920s that's adapting a, a novel by Hugo, which is with a, a blind woman and a grotesque kind of figure. I, I think that might have actually influenced Lee and Kirby's representation. I get into that in the uh, in the in the article, but um, yeah, there, there is a, um, that, that's definitely Alicia Masters' purpose in, in, at least originally is to, um, is to have her provide sympathy for, for, uh, for Ben Grimm, who is a monstrous quote unquote looking figure um, by having her uh, be blind, but be also be able to see, you know, his, his inner beauty. Yeah, I think this is the question of is it disability community, I think is a really good one, but I think also comes down to who's in the room and who's at the table, right? So it's one thing to say like, that could be disability community and I am personally available to be arm candy for the thing, but um, I wasn't at the table. And so what I see from that is similar to like, um, you know, people are entitled to their own experiences. And I think for people with disabilities and, and people with, experiencing various levels of marginality where media is often not made for us we're in the habit of reading through right it's a we i think there's a lot that's talked about around like uh certain certain dudes can just go to the movies and see their experience on the screen whenever they want and and lots of other people are in the habit of reading through text to find something that's useful for them and sometimes that bumps up against someone else's interpretation so like for me I found the movie The Shape of Water really upsetting for similar reasons. The idea that a, a woman with a disability would only be uh, appealing to a fish monster upsets me. Um, mm. And the ways in which that feeds into also like her own fantasies about able-bodiedness, I found that upsetting. Some other people found it really empowering. I'm not necessarily interested in adjudicating how that goes, but I think it is worth thinking about who's at the table when these stories are being told and um, why we see so many of one type of story, um, you know, noticing those trends, I think can tell you a lot about um, who is being used for what as a literary device, as opposed to a full person. Let, let me say that was very helpful for me. I, I appreciate you for sharing that. Thanks, I'm glad. So we are out of time. I don't know if you have any final thoughts, Anil? Uh, I do not, but I did want to offer the panelists an opportunity to have a parting comment if we have the time. Yeah. A very brief I, parting comment. Feel brief. <laughs> uh, this is Joe. I, I'll say something brief. I'll just say, if you have the opportunity to give uh, a help someone who is a person who is blind or low vision, put their voice out there in, a, in an authentic way and allow them to share it. Please do. Nice. I just want to say thank you very much for inviting me on this panel. It's been wonderful. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. And yeah, if you have the opportunity to let someone who's blind share their voice, um, you should pay them a lot. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> can't, can't top that. Thank you all. I enjoyed this. It was very helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Neil. guys. Thanks, thank you, Neil. Take care. All right. Thank awesome. you all. And if your question was not answered, once again, we'll try to get that conversation going uh, after this event, because there were still a few more that we didn't get to. Um, to the panelists, go ahead and turn off your video. And at this time, we are hoping to get Chansey Fleet on. Um, and she left and rejoined as panelists, but we don't see her yet. So, oh, there she is. Yay, perfect timing. <laughs>